you have your Bibles, turn with me to Revelation chapter 13. And we're going to look at verses 11 through 18. You'll remember two weeks ago, we looked at chapter 12, where Satan was fighting the battle in heaven, and Michael kicked him out of heaven. And uh, so we know that he's called the dragon, and that is Satan. Last week in the first 10 verses, we looked at the beast that rose out of the sea that we know is the Antichrist. And today we're going to look at the beast that rises out of the earth, that's the false prophet, that promotes the Antichrist. Now, many theologians believe today that we are already way down that road to the mark of the beast. For example, there's a thing in Europe called Privia. Now, I actually tried to sign up for Privia several years ago. Nothing wrong with Privia. But it's one of these things, that's, they're the precursors, if you will, of the mark of the beast. You have to be European in order to get Privia. Otherwise, I would have had it already. And the reason being is while all the rest of us are going through the immigration lines, with Privia, you just put your, your, your left eye up so it can read your eye and your right thumbprint. And as long as it matches, they know who you are because they've done an in-depth background study on who you are. And you go through. And the reason I like Privia is it's 10 to 1. It takes immigration officers a, 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 bit, a bit of time to find out who you are. But with Privia, it knows who you are. And so that was kind of the precursor. It's not the mark of the beast, so I didn't have a problem getting it, but I couldn't get it because I'm not European. Even though I thought about applying for a European passport, that's a whole different story. Um, but anyway, uh, what we're going to see here, oh, by the way, how many of you got North Carolina driver's license? I didn't bring mine with me. It's in my desk. But you'll notice some of them have a star, and some of them don't. Well, it, there's a day coming where you have to have that star for you to get on an airplane because it's just like a passport abroad. It's going to be your ID to get you here, uh, go, get through security. And so mine has a star. Debbie's doesn't have the star. That's just another way. By the way, there are multitudes of these, these kind of programs out there, and they're multiplying every day. And what's going to happen is when the Antichrist comes on the scene, he's just going to unify all those, and there will be a way to detect the mark of the beast, and you will not be able to buy or sell or hold a job or anything. Even the bare necessities of life, you will not be able to have those if you don't take the mark of the beast. And so what we're going to see here is Satan's final battle will be relentless. He's mimicking the Trinity here. You have Satan, and he creates his own unholy trinity between the dragon, the antichrist, and the false prophet. And by the way, these three and a half years will be a display of deception like this world has never, ever seen before. So beginning in verse 11, John tells us, he says, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb yet he spoke as a dragon and he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and he makes the earth and all those who dwell in it to worship the first beast who had a fatal wound that was healed and he performs great signs so that even makes fire come down from heaven to the earth in the presence of men and he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which he was given to perform in the presence of the beast, and telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image of the beast who had a wound by the sword, but yet has come back to life. And it will be given to him to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast will speak and cause many who do not worship the image to be killed. And he causes all, great and small, rich and poor, free man and slaves, to be given a mark on the right hand or on their forehead. And he provides that no one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now here's wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. There are three things I think we need to know in order to really put this together. Now remember, Revelation tells us that we are blessed when we read through Revelation, when we hear Revelation. And the reason that we are blessed is because God is actually allowing us to look into the future. This is what is coming to this world, and God is allowing us as believers to look at this and get an understanding of what's, what's taking place. So the dragon has already been released, the, the Antichrist has already come up, and now the false prophet is going to promote him. They're on the scene. And what we have here, in opposition of the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we have an unholy trinity of the devil called the dragon, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. Now I want us to notice what John says here. He says, I saw another beast coming up, but this time out of the earth, but he only had two horns like a lamb. Now remember the one coming up out of the sea? 
had ten horns and had crowns on those horns. This is just one that has two horns, and he's like a lamb. So he's describing both of them with the same exact word, the beast, same type of an individual, a beast, but he's different because he's related to the other beast, but he's different because he only has two horns. They're different in appearance. Notice what he says, with two horns. Now, it's like a lamb. And by the way, when a lot of people believe that when the Antichrist comes the, uh, to be born, that he's going to be, everybody immediately is going to know it. Back in the 70s, they had all these movies. The Omen. And you, guys, you guys remember that? That was about the devil. Rosemary's Daughter. What was that about? It was about the devil. Listen, Hollywood has Hollywoodized all these things about what the Antichrist will be. But the long and the short of it, I don't, because of the way that he's described here, he's lamb-like. He's gentle. He's cute. He's great. But all of a sudden, when he, re when he rises up, then we'll realize he's the Antichrist. There's going to be such a great deception here. People, I don't think, will know that he's the Antichrist until it's time for him to come to power. The people say, well, why does he have the two horns like a lamb? Some people think, well, it's because he's going to be over the religious section, but also over the political section. It could be that he has power over both, this, this false prophet. We know that the, that the uh, Antichrist does, but what about the false prophet? He probably does also. Uh, or it could just be that that's what lambs have as two horns. But the fact is, he's not going to look exactly like the, the first beast, but he will have a relationship with him. And so notice here it says, despite what the lamb looks like, the message of the second beast is this. He's going, to, he's going to make people bow down and worship the first beast as we see he's subservient. One comes up out of the land, one comes up out of the sea, one has two horns, one has ten horns. One promotes the other one. And he didn't say, bow down, bow down to me. He says, bow down to the dragon and the first beast. And so the first beast we know does obviously have more power, more influence, more pull. But I find this interesting here about the whole idea of the dragon and these two beasts. Because if you think about it, we talked last week about the Antichrist, and we know that anti does mean against, in opposition to, but also means another. And too many times I think we focus on the fact that, yes, the devil is against God, the Antichrist is against Jesus, yes, this beast, the false prophet, is against the Holy Spirit, but not only that, they're, they're supplying themselves to be another. So what you have here you, with the dragon, you have another father. With the Antichrist, you have another Christ. With the uh, beast that's just come in in this chapter here that looks like a lamb, he's going to be another Holy Spirit. And of course, they're going to be false. They're going to be false. And I think we'll see that as we look at his name. When we look at the 666, I think we'll see that that's what they are. They are another Holy Spirit. And so what do you have? You have this unholy trinity standing in total opposition to the real trinity, the one who loved, that loved humanity and gave, gave the second part of the trinity uh, as, as a blood sacrifice for humanity. And, and, and for 2,000 years, we've rejected that. Humanity has rejected that uh, sacrifice. And so here this unholy trinity is coming on the scene, another trinity. And the sad thing is most of humanity is going to follow them down that road. So we realize that the, the, the Antichrist here and the, the prophet, they are a person. Next is his position. Look at verse 12 through 15. He exercises authority of the first beast when he's in his presence, but he causes the whole earth to bow down and those who dwell in the uh, the earth to worship the beast. Now, I find this interesting here <clears throat> when he talks about those who are killed with a deadly wound. It's extremely clear this man has a position of power and influence. Why? Because he performs great signs. He even makes fire come down from heaven. Now, this is kind of interesting. You remember what happened when Elijah, what did Elijah say? Let the true God prove himself and come down and consume us. It very well may be because we know that this false prophet is going to have all kind of power to produce signs and wonders, even to make fire come down from heaven. He may himself say, let the true God let fire come down from heaven. And through his false deception, he will have this false miracle that will take place. We don't know exactly how it's going to happen, but he's putting himself on the same level, if you will, of a prophet of God. Again, he's another prophet, but he's not a prophet of the true and living God. So he deceives all who dwell on the earth, except those who are believers, those who don't take the, the mark. And he does this because he's granted, notice it says he's granted, he's given the power temporarily for 42 months to do this, which I'm thankful he's only got limited power. God allowed it to happen, and God's going to one day stop it uh, after, the 40, after the 42 months. He was granted power to breathe image into the beast. Now, who, who breathes image into you and me? God. I find this interesting. He's given the authority, the power, because remember, images, <coughs> images don't breathe. In fact, the psalmist tells us, why do, why do you worship false idols? 
They're, they're made of gold and silver and wood, and they have eyes, but they don't see. They have mouths, but they don't speak. But so now notice this. This is going to be a different kind of an image. This image is going to have eyes to see. This image is going to have a mouth that can speak. What is it doing? This is the unholy trinity setting up for the whole world to believe. Wow, look at that. Even the image speaks. Not just the beast, not just the prophet, not just the dragon, but the image that is set up speaks. Something that's never happened before. He exercises authority of the first beast. Notice what it says here. <coughs> the rising of the beast of the earth is essential because he's the satanic prophet. He's the one who promotes the Antichrist. What we need to, to think about is most people don't really want to eliminate religion. But what they want to do is they want to create their own religion. They want to create a religion without God in it. Which, by the way, if you're a true believer, it's not a religion. It's faith put in Jesus Christ. But notice what it says. He's given the power to perform great signs and wonders. The beast rising up from the earth has great signs and wonders that back up his false teaching. A specific miracle, like the one we had talked about, fire coming down, is going to be one. Now, whether this is through supernatural, demonic ability to do this, or if it's technological, because with technology, we can do a lot of things. The fact is, this miracle, the way it's described, is going to be phenomenal. The whole world will back up and say, wow, how amazing. <clears throat> Just like with the Antichrist. Who can make war with him? I mean, they can do miracles. The, the false prophet will have the same power that the Antichrist has, but he's not promoting himself. He's promoting the Antichrist. There's a supernatural power that is out there that is working against God. God gave that power to the devil, and there's a day he's taking it away from him. Again, he's got those 42 months, those three and a half years. Just like in the days of the Exodus when Aaron did miracles, and up to a point, remember the Egyptian uh, magicians, they, they duplicated, oh, you did this, we can do it, up to a point. And then all of a sudden, God took over, and they couldn't produce it. We saw that in Exodus chapter 7 through 9. And remember in Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 5, God shares with us that supernatural works on behalf of false prophets and idols, that they will, they will be there in the last days. And he says, don't pay attention to the miracles. He says, pay attention to the message. And that's what's scary about today. There's so many people looking for signs and wonders. They're looking for the miracles. You know, just like with the, the storm that we're facing. There will be those that if, if, uh, if God does not turn the storm back and it does mass damage all up the East Coast, there will be those who blame God for that. Look, God's just not powerful enough. Look at what, uh, you know, all, the, all these people are praying and, and God's not answering prayer. Of course, then also if God does turn it and it does absolutely no damage, you go, well, that had nothing to do with God. You, they're, they're, humanity's not going to give God credit for anything whatsoever. <clears throat> but God says don't look at the miracle. God says look at the message. And what is the message that we see? We need to be careful. Several years ago, there was a multi-denominational conference, and I remember this. And they had a banner up over the platform, and it said, Unity Under Signs and Wonders. Now, we need to realize that true, genuine Christianity cannot unite with something that's less than true, genuine Christianity. We cannot unite with things, and that's what they have to do. They have to, to just, let me give you an example. Um, with Lausanne, uh, one of the reasons about that uh, in, the, in the Lausanne Covenant, nothing's really mentioned about baptism except baptism is necessary uh, to be in good standing with the church. Well, the reason being is, you know, some denominations baptize by sprinkling from when you're a child, and they believe that has specific value in it. Others say, no, you need to be baptized after, by immersion like the Lord was after salvation. Well, the two aren't going to come together. One, one says, no, this way. One says, this way. So what you do is you just don't talk about it. You don't talk about baptism. Salvation. Salvation comes to a lot of different ways to a lot of different people, so we can't talk about salvation. And the day's coming when we will not be able to talk about the differences between salvation because Christianity, true, genuine Christianity, is a threat to the whole ecumenical movement. Why? Because Jesus made it clear, I and I alone am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. That's what he said. It's, 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 it's inclusive, or it's exclusive. No other way. And so for all these others to say, let's unite under signs and wonders. The devil would be happy to do that. 
The Antichrist would be happy to do that. Yeah, let's just all love each other. Would look, look at the signs and wonders. Well, we already know it's a false prophet. But they want to incorporate his into it. That's why Jesus said, don't pay attention to the miracles. Pay attention to the message. The message, if it lifts up Jesus Christ as the, as the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world, it's a great message. And if it doesn't, then there's problems with it. But notice the, the image of the beast. He's going, he's going to be animated in some way to where he breathes. And it's going to be really impressive. So why is all this happening? Why is all this taking place? We need to remember what Paul tells us in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He says, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of the devil with all power and with all signs and lying wonders and with all unrighteousness and deception among those who perish. Why? Because they did not receive, and you might want to, to highlight that, the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send a strong delusion that they should not believe because they will believe a lie, that they should be condemned, everyone who did not believe the truth, but they had pleasure in unrighteousness. And that word pleasure means they, they had great pleasure in unrighteousness. I want to show you this here because this is important. God did not send them a delusion so that they would not believe. God sent them a delusion because they did not believe. Think about it. For 2,000 years, up until the cross, he was giving humanity a chance. He says, follow me, I'm, I'm going to provide a Messiah for you. 2,000 years after the cross, he says, the Messiah has been there. He was nailed to, your, to the cross for you. The blood has been shed for you. You can be saved. For 2,000 years, humanity said, no, we reject that. And God says, because you refuse to accept the truth. Actually, says the love of the truth. By the way, what's the love of the truth? The word love there is a noun. It's not a verb here. What is it? It's Jesus. He's the love of the truth. He loved you so much, he died on the cross. He loved me so much, he died on the cross. When you became a believer, because you fell in love with the love of the truth. You accepted the love, which is Jesus, of the truth. And you accepted all the gospel with him. He says, because they would not receive, God says, I'm going to send a delusion upon them, then they'll be condemned with all the rest of them. But it's not because God wanted them to not believe. It's because they refused to believe after all this time before the cross and now after the cross. The third thing, the beast has got a plan. Look at verses 16 through 18. He causes all, both small and great and rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand and on their foreheads. And that no one may buy or sell except the one who has the mark of the beast or the number of his name. Now, under the government of the beast and his associate, the false prophet, you're going to be given a mark, or they will be given a mark. We'll be gone. The rapture's already taken place, thank, thank the Lord. We're gone. You know, we're gone, who knows, several days, several weeks, several months. You know, we're, we're gone, and then all this seven years of tribulation breaks loose. We're gone. But remember the 144,000 Jews that are saved and the multitudes from every tribe and tongue that will be saved? They will have to go through all this, but you may, you may remember that they were sealed not with a mark, but they were sealed by God. They had God's seal on them. And so they're going to have to go through this. They will not take the mark of the beast in the reason because God's already sealed them for heaven. But they'll have to go through it. And they'll be denied, no, sir, you cannot have a job, not unless you take the mark of the beast. Well, I can't do that. I'm a believer in Jesus. Then you won't have a job. You can't buy groceries. Now, I know there'll be some who, you know, would have compassion on you, and they might buy a few groceries for you. That might last for a little while. It's not going to last for long. Because you're somehow going to have to be seen worshiping the image and you're going to have to show them the mark of the beast or you won't be able to buy or sell or anything. That's what's headed. And those people will have to go through this. And some of them will die from starvation and some of them will be killed for not bowing down to the beast. The second beast here restructures the economy of the world. Without this mark, no one can do any type of business, even the necessities of life. Only those who stand for Christ will be exempt from this. They'll be the ones who die. They'll be disenfranchised, if you will, because they don't accept the mark. Now, something interesting here, this word for mark uh, in Greek is normally applied to marking something. It isn't normally meant for marking people. Like Paul, for example, talks about being marked. Paul says, I'm a doulos. I had a, a hole pierced in my ear that showed that I was a bond slave for Jesus Christ. I was a willing slave. That, that word was not used. It was a word that's normally not used for a person. So some people think, this mark's going to be symbolic, and it could be. It could be that, uh, well, for example, like when I go to the grocery store and I don't have my, my 
uh, card with me to, to get the discount, I can punch in my phone number and it, uh, it attaches to what I'm doing and it, it gives me a discount, okay? It may be, that, that's, just, that's just symbolic and it may be a symbolic mark. It may be a number that you have to have, remember in your head or you have to give some type of a credit card out or it may be a physical mark. Uh, this past week, going through this really made me interested because back in 1998, I started looking at, um, there was Newsweek magazine back then, I think it was March, April of 1998, and I was looking at uh, the implants because they had stopped or putting them in animals and started putting them in people. And one of the big things was they were talking about Prince Charles had an implant so they could track him everywhere he goes in case somebody kidnapped him, they would know how to get him. Well, I, I was kind of curious, how much has things as far as implants changed from 1998 until now. Here we are 21 years later. And I mean, I was, I was amazed. Do you know for 200, I, I, I can actually get you one for $115, but if you want a good implant with all your information on it, they can, they can implant it in the top of your hand here. They can implant it behind your ear. And you walk by a scanner and, and every bit of information about you that's on that chip Will be, will be transmitted. We've come a long ways. I don't know that it will be something like that. But listen, here's what's scary. It's possible even today. Today, they could require the mark of the beast, and the technology is available to make it happen. So whether symbolic or not doesn't matter. Uh, the fact is, it's coming. So verse 18, the number of the beast. This is where I want to camp for just a few minutes. Because there's been so many different interpretations of this. What is the number of the beast? Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding, notice that word calculate. Calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. And his number is 666. Now, the question is, does this tell us that if we add all these things up, that we'll come up with 666, that it might be the mark of the beast? Well, let me just give you a few, and there's been multi, there, there has been multitudes upon multitudes of people who people thought they were the mark of the beast. But some of the best ones I thought, they, they thought the Antichrist would be the Pope. Y'all ever heard that before? Well, the Pope's the Antichrist. The first Pope was the Antichrist, and, uh, so, and he's passed it all the way down. John Knox, seriously? John Knox? They thought he was the Antichrist. Napoleon, I can see why they might think Napoleon. All these people had, had names that they added up to the 666. Hitler, Mussolini, Stalin, even Martin Luther King Jr. I remember I actually heard a message in a, in a little Baptist church in Woodstock, Georgia, not First Baptist Woodstock, a little church called New Home Baptist Church. And I remember the preacher getting up and saying, Martin Luther King Jr. is the, because this was after he got shot. They thought he was going to rise back up. Remember the head's wounded to death and he raises back up. They said, because Martin is six letters, Luther is six letters, and he signs it King Jr. That's six letters. So 666. Well, I'm not saying it's not him. I mean, if the devil could raise him to life, I just don't see it. The point is this. If we're just going numerically, adding things together, we're going to come up with a plethora of ideas as who the Antichrist is. But the truth of the matter is, it's probably none of these whatsoever. So what is it? If it's not that, God's obviously given us an idea. There's some way we can figure out who the Antichrist is, or at least recognize him. Every other thing falls short. Now, I like this here. Notice it says 666. Here's my question. Six would be an imperfect number if seven is the number of perfection. And I know Ben's going to like this, and Ed's going to like this, because they like the number seven. Well, if you, if you attribute seven to Jesus, and you attribute seven to the Holy Spirit, and you attribute seven to God the Father, what do you have? You have seven, seven, seven. Is it possible? I don't know. I'm just saying. I'm throwing this out there. Is it possible that the 666 is showing the shortfall, saying that this, this, holy, this unholy trinity doesn't measure up to the real trinity? The real trinity is perfection in, in each person and together, their perfection. And this one falls short. It could be. I don't know. Or maybe it goes back to Solomon's time. Remember Solomon in 1 Kings 10, 14? Every year he received 666 talents of gold. Now you're waiting. You're some preacher. I, I gotta, I've got to see you connect this to Solomon. Okay? Don't think that dog's going to hunt. But it might. Because what happened to Solomon? Solomon was a good man. But he fell. He was a good man that turned evil. The Antichrist, I think, will be a good man when he first comes on the scene. And once he rises to power, he will become evil. It's a possibility. The fact is, none of us know. But here's what we know. We know that there's a man coming, and God has a mark on him. And I think at that time, it will be revealed, and we will know who it is. But not until God's time, he reveals it. So you have the two satanic beasts that are imitation. They're the false Christ and the false Holy Spirit. And you have the false 
God the Father, if you will, through Lucifer. So you have this unholy trinity, and all they're doing is imitating. Isn't it amazing? The devil doesn't ever come up with anything new. He doesn't. He's not very creative. He just reuses the same old thing generation after generation after generation after generation. And all he does is imitate. Now, they say that imitation is the best form of flattery. I don't think God's flattered by this. This unholy imitation. But that's what it is. It's an imitation. I had a friend who used to work for the Federal Reserve Bank. And he works with IMB now. and been with them for about the last 20 years. But uh, he, he always told me, he said, I said, how do you know... I mean, he can just close his eyes and touch it, and he can just go through <coughs> stacks of $100 bills, and all of a sudden he goes, that's, the, that's not real. That's not real. How, how do you know? You're not even looking at it. He says, when you know the genuine thing, you don't fall for the fake. And he said, there are so many fakes out there. He said, there's a multitude of ways of faking a dollar bill. He said, if you, you try to learn all those, you're going to mess up. He said, learn the one thing. Learn what's the original, and you'll never have to worry about all the false ones. And he's right. If you and I, instead of, instead of trying to figure out who is the mark of the beast, who is the Antichrist, God will reveal him in his time. What we need to be focused on is the real. We need to be focusing on Jesus. I mean, after all, he's the one who died for us. But notice this word calculate. It means to reckon, to compute, to account. And so we, he says calculate the number of the beast. I want to remind you there's a difference between humanism and humanitarianism. Okay? Humanitarianism is just people meeting the needs of other people, whether it's through food or through, through housing, whatever. It's just meeting the needs. But humanism is worship of humanity. And here's, that's what really this is boiling down to. This unholy trinity is a, is a humanistic trinity, and what they're doing, they're wanting you to stop worshiping God, the true and living God, and start worshiping man. That's what really it's all about. And what we need to understand is that there's a basic principle here, and I hope that, that everybody hears this the way I, I mean it, but Christianity is a threat to world religion. And we need to understand that during the tribulation, there will be a one-world government, there will be a one-world religion, and there will be a one-world economic system. And if you don't conform your life to all three, they're going to threaten you. Why? Because true Christianity is a threat to that kind of a system. Christianity claims to be mutually exclusive, but the rest of the world says unity at any cost. Let's dumb it down. Let's take Jesus out of the mix. Let's put man in the mix. Let's lift man up, exalt man. I mean, look at all man has done in this world. Look at all the great things we have done. We deserve to be worshipped. That will be their attitude. They have to make room for all the other beliefs. How do, how do you get a Buddhist and a Hindu and a Muslim and a Christian and a Jehovah Witness and you all, on and on and on, and an atheist and an atheist? How do you get all those beliefs together under one religion? Well, any of those that claim to be exclusive, you've got to get rid of them. They've got to go. They're a threat. I shared with some of you, I think it was on Wednesday night, back in 2008, uh, when I was at the G8 Summit in Padilla, Thailand, the question came up about the one world religion. And I heard it said by one of the leaders there, it is time for a one world religion. I know that at Lausanne 2010 in Cape Town, South Africa, I know that it was discussed. And again, it was, it was time for a one world religion. And what that world religion will do is country by country, they'll start signing up for it. And then the preachers will be told what you can preach and what you cannot preach against. And all the things that would set Christianity apart, they will not be able to preach. So we're, I mean, I think we are on the threshold. I just don't know how long before. I don't think we're even on the sidewalk anymore. I mean, we've parked the bus. We've come up the sidewalk. We're at the door. And I just don't know how long before the Lord opens the door. I think we stand on the threshold of eternity. I think the, I really believe that the seven years of tribulation is just right around the corner. And I could be wrong. It could be a thousand years. But there's just a such, when I read through Scripture here, and not just these Scriptures, but when I read through any book of God's Word, as I'm going through it, I just sense this urgency, we're closer than we think. And that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. I heard Adrian Rogers. I loved Adrian Rogers. I wish he was still with us. I do. So, so when, I, when I said I, when I, when I heard him this week, I didn't hear him literally. I didn't go to heaven and talk with him or anything, so y'all haven't lost me there yet. Maybe someday. But anyway... I heard him on the radio, and I love what he said. He said, you know, 
The problem with Christians today is we've lost our, our vision of what heaven really is like. He said, if we could go to heaven for five minutes, he said, we'd, walk, we'd come back down here and we wouldn't even look both ways before crossing the street. You get that? He's right. If you knew how beautiful, how wonderful heaven is going to be, why look both ways? I mean, I'm ready to go if we could just see it. And of course, now Adrian is there, and he knows exactly what he saw. So the devil's going to do his best to create a religion that's going to deceive people. But here's what it boils down to. What can I do with this today? It's coming. I can't stop it. I can't speed it up, and I can't slow it down, and I don't want to. I want God in his timing, in his way. I want him to have everything that he wants to do in his timing, in his way. So what can we do in the meantime? Well, we need to realize this. Some people put their faith in governments, others in money and the economy. Some put their faith and trust in education or religion, their religious affiliation. By the way, getting to heaven does not require you to be a Baptist, nor being a Baptist gets you to heaven. The only thing that's going to get you to heaven is putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and repenting of your sins. None of these others meet the needs that humanity has. They don't satisfy it. Only a personal faith and trust in Jesus Christ is sufficient for the day against the Lord. When the Lord comes back, you better be ready. Our hope rests on this. Two things is what your hope rests on. I love this. It rests on an old bloody cross 2,000 years ago. And it rests on an empty tomb. Because you see, 2,000 years ago, when God gave his own blood for you and me and all of humanity, there's, there's not a worse slap in the face that anybody could do to God than create a false Christ. Because the true and living Christ died on the old rugged cross and shed his blood for me and for you. How dare humanity bow down to anything less? Because he did it in love. He was love. He is love. The Bible says that God is love. So that's the only thing that we rest on is that old bloody cross and the empty tomb. Aren't you thankful that they didn't find Jesus there? He's risen. We need to remember that imitations, often they're very similar. If they, if they were radically different, people wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't be deceived by them. Very similar. This Antichrist is going to come. He's, go, he's going to do great wonders, and, and people are going to think, this is the Christ. This is the one. Yes, I'll bow down, and they'll bow down willingly. Except those who are believers, and they say, no, nope, he's not the real one. I know the real one, and he's not it. So for us, we need to get to know the real one. And instead of obsessing about fear and all the things that's going to take place in the, the last chapters here in Revelation, they're going to take place, but it's okay. Again, you and I won't be here. But here's what I'm convinced. As we're going through this, we're blessed. But why is God blessing us by hearing these things? How does it bless us to know that the Antichrist is coming? I think it blesses us because we know what the future is, and God's blessing us that we can bless others. Have you ever noticed God doesn't just bless you so you can have the blessing? God blesses you to bless others. Michael will tell you, every mission trip I've ever been on, we go thinking we are going to be a blessing, and we are. But it's like this, and, and the people there bless us like this. We have been given the truth of Jesus Christ that we might be a blessing. So I want to close with this. David Platt said, and I think it applies to this, because I think this is what God wants us to do with this. Every, <clears throat> every saved person this side of heaven owes the gospel to every lost person this side of hell. Can I repeat it? Every saved person this side of heaven owes the gospel to every lost person this side of hell. And it's true. We know what's coming, but see, we don't, even, we don't even have the promise tomorrow, much less next month, next year. We don't know that we'll live up until to the rapture. We may be gone before then. I hope that knowing what is in store for humanity, I hope what it does for us is when we pull out of the parking lot, I hope you look at the homes here and you realize that if these people here don't put their faith and trust in Christ or if they haven't already put their faith and trust in Christ, they're going to spend eternity separated from God. They'll never know the one who loved them so much that he shed his blood. They won't know him. I hope that when you back out of your driveway and you see your neighbor's car or the guy that lives next door to you, I hope you think about it. That's what's coming for these folks. If they make it that far, what happens if they die before? They're going, they're going to hell. They're going to spend eternity separated from God because they didn't know. This, this 
statement attached with this scripture makes me want to go out and tell everybody, in Thailand, absolutely, India, absolutely, but right across the street and with my neighbors. I would say the people I work with, but I work with Nancy, and then y'all start questioning her salvation. <laughs> but to people we work with, think about it. Some of, some of you guys, you work 30, 40, 50 years somewhere. What about the people you work? Wouldn't it be a shame for them to miss eternity? I mean, what if God put them in your path to work with you for 30 years and you go to heaven and you're up there with Adrian and all the angels and then they miss eternity? What a tragedy that is. I hope that every one of us in this room, when we leave here, I hope there's a burden in our heart to realize that the reason God is going to send a delusion and that they'll believe it is not because he wants them not to believe, but because they refuse to believe. And some of them refuse to believe because they've never heard. If you've never sat down with somebody who's never, ever, ever, ever heard the name of Jesus, and you start explaining who he is, and you watch their eyes light up, there's nothing in the world like it. I remember when I was in Tanzania the first time, I got to lead a 64-year-old lady to Christ, and her question to me still haunts me to this day. She said, how long have you known and I said, well, I got, I've known since I was 12 years old, but I got saved when I was 18. And she said, and, you, and I was in my 50s then. She said, you're an old man now. I said, yes, I'm an old man now. She says, what took you so long? Because he, her mom and dad were already dead. Too late for them. And I have to ask myself, what took me so long?